that um, when they were translating Klingon into Shakespeare, I'm sorry, Shakespeare into Klingon, that um, there was no word for sun. There was a word for star, but there was a, a gap in there being, there being no word for sun. Boy, is that technical. There is now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the, the word for sun was introduced not because of that, but it, it got introduced. The word for sun is jewel. Think about it. In, in the context of you said, what you said. Um, how much did you pay attention to, like, allophones versus phonemes? Did, ah. you, did you, like, plan those out, or did you just kind of let them I let, fly? I let it fly. As I said, when, when this thing first started, I didn't know it was going to turn out turn out the way it did. So in my mind, the correct way to pronounce Klingon is the way I say it, or the way Christopher Lloyd says it, because he was first. <laughs> Uh, there's, but there's all kinds of slipping and sliding around. In fact, I was in, there was a meeting of the Klingon Language Institute in Brussels 10, 12 years ago, which is the first time I met European speakers of Klingon. And there was a big, by the time I got, I wasn't there at the beginning of the meeting, by the time I got, there was an argument going on between the American speakers of Klingon and the German, in particular, speakers of Klingon, about the pronunciation of ch, which I write with a capital H. There's a whole writing system thing of Klingon I can tell you about, too. But anyway, um, because in the dictionary, I explain that the capital H, I write with a capital H, is pronounced like this sound. I, I give a number of examples, but one of them is the sound at the end of the composer's name, Bach. Because that's what we say it. Okay? It's not the way they say it in Germany. It's, it's a softer sound. It's something called Bach. So the H is <laughs> no, the H is <laughs> All right. Klingon Empire is a big place. This can happen. <laughs> yeah. How did you figure out orthography? For the orthography, there's two orthographic systems. There's Klingon characters, these fun little squiggle things. Uh, the ones you see in the TV show and the movies and stuff, that's artwork. In other mm -hmm. words, the, the art people made it up. There has been no attempt ever to match that stuff up with the spoken language. Um, I've had discussions about it with, with, with one of the graphic designers, you know, that you know, we never agreed on, not, not that we had an argument, but we never agreed on things like, which way do you read it? And is it left to right or right to left? Oh. This guy thought it would be a good idea to read it from the middle outwards. <laughs> uh, the system that, the, 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 the people, the, 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 the Klingon speaking community around the world has adapted that system and make the characters look a little bit different, but makes them match the, the Klingon phonemes. So they do write with it. People mm -hmm. do it. And, and, and the Monopoly box and that phony ad, they use that kind of writing on the box. And it said Klingon language in those, in those characters. Mm -hmm. um, the system that I developed was developed for the actors. Okay? And I did not assume that the actors knew <coughs> the IPA or something like that. So I said, okay, here's, here's a phonetic key. You read all the sounds all the letters like you would in English, with the exception of the capital letters, there's something special about them. So the capital H is a ch, the capital Q is a ch, you know, the capital S is a ch, not a s, and things like that. So I got used to writing it, and I used a capital I for is, and only pronounce it I or E. Um, so I got used to writing it with these capital letters to indicate, pay special attention to, to this transcription. And so when I wrote the dictionary, I did the same thing. I just, I just kept the system, which is why if you see written, Klingon written with Roman letters, they just capital letters that look like they're randomly popping, popping in and out. But that's what it is. Now, I could have, and I got letters from people saying, you know, you didn't have to do that. You, know, you could have done this, you could have done that. You didn't need to have the capital letters. And they're right. They're right. But they're not Klingons. Klingons with <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, from what you said about the Klingon Language Institute, I'm wondering whether it operates as an academy. They operate as an academy in, in, in the sense of, of, of saying this is or this is not good Klingon. I operate in the sense of the academy. Uh, and, and not by choice. I mean, I haven't said no, but I, I, I didn't choose to do that. I didn't establish that I should do it. The Klingon speaking community took, decided themselves that nobody except me could make up new words. Nobody except me could settle grammatical disputes. Uh, they're very good at putting words together. You can, make, you can have compounding, now compounds, in Klingon. They're very good at doing that and making up new 
things to say. Yeah, yeah. In that way, they're very clever at working, wor working out grammar. They're also very clever at finding inconsistencies and problems. There's actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an internet page you can find which lists all the mistakes I've ever made. <laughs> um, but, but in terms of saying this is it or this is new, you know, that falls on me. I've never met an academy before. <laughs> <laughs> this for for Navi, which is the language for Avatar, it doesn't work that way. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a kind of committee. Uh, and they get together and, and, and propose new words and discuss mm -hmm. all these things. They run it by the guy who made it up. It's a guy named Paul Frommer. And, and he's, he's, he gives it his blessing, I guess, but he's not the sole... He doesn't have the sole responsibility for this thing. As I'm getting along... I'm thinking that's maybe not a bad idea. <laughs> so far, that's not the case. I got an email this morning. I that there, there was this Kep I told you about this little meeting, this big little meeting in Germany <laughs> last week. Well, as a result of that, I got this long email with, how do you do this? And what about that? And you said this, but is this this way or is it that way? And they're all mathematicians, and I don't understand the chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, as far as you know, have other recent languages like Dothraki or new alien languages that they've been developed with the same sort of level of detail and consistency. More so. More so. More as I say, Klingon, Klingon was, was never, the original plan was never to develop it as much as it's been developed, or never to use it as much as it's been used. Um, so I liken the development of Klingon to a, a movie set, or a movie prop. In fact, I have, mm. and hold the camera don't look, I have at home <laughs> an actual knife, okay, from Star Trek The Next Generation, it was seen on TV. It's a prop. It's made out of rubber. Okay. And on one side of the knife, it's it's, it's in the it's in the sheep. You know, it's, it's all detailed. It looks really good. And the sheep is I don't know, it's about it's about this big. But if you turn it around, the other side is just flat. Okay. Because it was to put on the guy's hip. He never drew the knife. It was just a prop. It was just just a costume. So the maker of this thing just made the part that you needed for the TV show. Didn't make the whole life. But they had to have in mind what the whole knife looked like. Same thing with the movie set. You know, if you've ever seen a movie set, it looks terrific. I've been, I've been on the bridge of the Enterprise. It's amazing. So you walk over there and there's a bunch of plywood. <laughs> okay? The doors that, you know, open and go, whoosh, whoosh. There's no motion sensors. There's these guys pulling it out. <laughs> but whoever designed this thing had to have in mind, how does this work? How does it all fit together? When you walk through that door, where is it going? Even if I'm not building that place. So the language Klingon was originally designed like that. The only part that was, you know, invented or, or, or designed was what was needed for the films. That's expanded some since then, but the original plan was not that. Uh, both Navi and Dothraki in particular took a different approach. The, the, not, the guy who did Navi's, Paul Frommer, I think he had something like four years to work on this language before they started shooting the, the film. And he thought about it a lot and developed it a lot and, and figured it all out. You know, I didn't make up all the pronouns. They didn't all come up initially. And the guy who did Dothraki is David Peterson. He's a real commoner. And he's the, actually, he's the only guy whose full-time job is making up languages for, for TV shows and movies and stuff like that. That's his, his full-time occupation. Um, and he's, and he's made up a bunch of languages, not just for TV, before that. He, he, he got the job by winning a contest. The, the, the Thraki, the, the game, with game of Thrones people, had, some, had people send in language samples. And, and he won, and it turned into a career for him. But that one is also really well thought out, okay, uh, and, and, and very, very detailed. Because uh, you know, people have said to me things like, oh, you made up a language. How long did it take? <laughs> and I say, so far, 30 years. <laughs> it's not done. It's, it's, it's never done. But their languages, those other two languages that are just, I think are a lot more fully developed than, than Klingon is. They probably don't get emails to know how to say scaling triangles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how does any of these, uh, if, you, if you know, compare with what Tolkien did was well. Tolkien is, is even more elaborate because Tolkien had a whole language history. Yeah, yeah. Okay, he yeah. didn't just he developed a couple of languages and the proto language that they came yeah, from yeah. and all that stuff. It's very elaborate. And then he developed a whole world 
<laughs> to, for these languages to be used in. The languages, the languages came first. Um, so his is his is, is is very very well developed. His is his is also very earthy. I mean, it's not Middle Earthy, but it's earthy. Yeah. It's based on yeah. based on a bunch of earth languages. Yeah. Um, how much of your life and time are now devoted to that <laughs> compared to your full time job? I no longer have a full time job. And, and, um, and how do you feel about it? Is yeah. it something you're happy to yeah. spend your time on, or does it start to feel like a burden? No, it's, ne it's, it's never been a burden until all these triangles. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta do a decahedron is causing me problems. I'm not joking. Anyway, uh, no, it's it's it's. It's been part of my life since what, 1983 or something like that. Uh, coming and going, meaning sometimes it's a big part because there's a project and some kind of fades to the background, but but it's always been there. Uh, I like it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that I got to do it. I know that it's that I lucked out. It was just a fluke. You know, it could have been somebody else. It had it been somebody else, I don't know if it would have worked out the same way. I don't see that as a compliment to me. And I also don't think that the phenomenon, you know, the language taking off the way it has, is a commentary about my cleverness as a language creator. I don't think it is a commentary that, boy, did I make up swell relative clauses. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, you know, it's, it's clearly the Star Trek connection. Uh, and people say, well, why cling on a nut Vulcan or, or something else? If you know Star Trek, you know, if you were going to go to a party, you know, would you rather be a Klingon or be a Vulcan? <laughs> Klingons are fun. Kling Klingons are, are, are loud and boisterous and goofy and carrying on and stuff like that. And the language is loud and boisterous and goofy and, and carrying on. And I think that's why of, of, of the Star, Star Trek languages, it caught, it, it caught on. Uh, so how much of the time does it take up now? Well, right now a lot because of this Klingon Christmas Carol thing coming up. But once that's over... You know, it'll come down again until, until more emails come, but it's there. It never goes away. It's, it, it's never gone. Uh, did you base any of the grammar on Mutsun? No, like no. I, I intentionally did not base it on anything, I hope. Uh, having said that, you know, you can't help but be influenced by what you know. And what I, what I studied the most when I was doing all this linguistic stuff, you know, in an academic setting, uh, was American Indian languages, primarily from the West Coast. Uh, and Chinese and Southeast Asian, Asian languages. So there's influence of those in there, but I hope not in a way that anyone other than me can detect. But I, I know what they are. And as soon as I would realize I was doing something, oh, that's like Navajo, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would do something totally different, but I wouldn't erase what I'd done either. So there's all kinds of things. Um, for Mutsun in particular, I did put in on purpose one suffix that I took from Woodson, that means the same thing, has the same grammatical function, the same meaning, and basically the same phenology.